At NASA, we have always answered the innate call to go. With Artemis, we are going to stay. Proving that humanity can live on the moon, Mars, and other worlds. And share the wonders of the solar system with all. Our story is one of people. All those who make this journey possible. From advocates across communities, to companies across industries, to countries around the world, we achieve this collective endeavor. Our efforts create impact for all. Technologies that revolutionize industries. And jobs that bring prosperity to people. The discoveries from space benefit the way we live on Earth today. And those from the moon will create a better future for generations to come. But to do that, we must go. Hi, I'm Chell Ingram. My name is Raja Chari. Kayla Barron. Kate Rubens. Hi, I'm Christina Cook. NASA astronaut Joe Acaba. Jessica Meir. Woody Hoberg. Anne McLean. Stephanie Wilson. My name is Johnny Kim. Nicole Mann. Victor Glover. Jessica Watkins. Hi, I'm Matthew Dominic. Jasmine Morbelli. Frank Rubio. Scott Tingle. This is what we do. This is what we will do. Let's go. We go to the moon to learn how to live on other planets. For the benefit of all. Going to space is awesome. My first flight was on the space shuttle. You get into the vehicle, you're all strapped in. You know, we have the countdown timer that's going on. You get to zero and the launch begins. In your mind, you're thinking, I can't believe this is actually happening. It's the coolest experience ever. Hola, Joseph. Es tu padre. Hey, Pops, it's, uh, it's good to hear your voice. Thanks for the support. The launch was awesome. When I look back to who inspired me, it started with my grandfather. He actually had the old films of the Apollo missions that we would watch. I've been fortunate that I've had those mentors that have supported me and motivated me to be where I am today. I was born in Southern California, reading, playing sports, Enjoyed being outdoors, spent some time in the United States Marine Corps Reserve, was a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer, did a lot of different jobs until I found the one that I felt was the most important job on the planet, which is being a school teacher. It was one of the jobs I never thought I would leave until I was uh, given this opportunity to become a NASA astronaut. NASA astronaut Joe Acaba making his third flight into space. I've had the opportunity to go on three space missions and I've spent about 306 days in space to actually walk on the moon. For me, to have that as a possibility is just incredible. This is our next step to explore places we have never been before. family and friends, our first astronaut, Kayla Barron. I think the thing that's most important to me is just the inspiration of exploration. I think we all have this innate sense to explore, whether you're the one who actually gets to step on the moon or not. I think it changes all of us to know that we can actually do things that would be unimaginable to the generations that came before us. 9-11 happened eight days before my 14th birthday, so I was in eighth grade. And I was really inspired by how our country responded to that really tragic event. It really made me realize that I wanted to serve and commit myself to something that was bigger than just me. And there's a huge diversity of opportunities in the Navy. 
whether it's flying a plane, driving a surface ship, driving a submarine, being a doctor. And I spent a week with the submarine warfare community, including a day underway. And I was so impressed by the sailors on that submarine. They just seemed like the kind of people who would teach me how to be a good leader. For me, the dream of becoming an astronaut cemented itself pretty late in my life. I went back to the Naval Academy to work for Admiral Ted Carter. And because I was working with him, I got to go to all of these really cool events and meet a lot of people who I had no business talking to, really. I met one of his classmates, former astronaut Kay Heyer, and she was telling me about one of her shuttle missions where they were building the early space station. And I said, you know, that sounds a lot like a submarine in space. She looked at me and she was like, it totally is. That's exactly what it's like. And that was sort of the lightning strike moment. As a kid, I knew about astronauts. I watched shuttle launches on TV. I knew we were in space, but never seemed like something that I could do. But I had really good mentorship at that time. You know, I shared that dream with my boss, Admiral Carter. He turned to me and he said, Kayla, do you know how you become an astronaut? You apply. And for me, that was the perfect mentorship I needed in that moment. I'm somebody who thinks really hard about everything I do, all the details. And he said, you know, it's actually pretty simple. You just got to put yourself out there and you never know what's going to happen. So I did apply and it ended up working out. Here I am. For me, every time I have an NBL run or every time I do a practice spacewalk and you get in that, uh, that suit, like we call it the EMU, and feel the gloves go on, feel the pressure build, uh, feel the fans start to flow and the, the air starts to come over the back of your head and you realize like this is it. That's when it really strikes me that this is, this is actually not a dream, this is actually happening. I'm uh, Raja Chari, I go by Grinder. Uh, I grew up in uh, Iowa and I went to the Air Force Academy and then MIT and then I uh, was an Air Force test pilot. If I asked my mom, she definitely has memories of me as a child talking about being an astronaut. Well, I always knew I wanted to uh, do something related to aviation, but at the same time, I think I also started to tell myself it wasn't really possible because it was just something to get let down from. Every phase of my life I had doubt, uh, whether it was at the Air Force Academy and wondering whether I could survive basic training, whether it was uh, when I was at MIT, or even pilot training, uh, failing check rides, uh, and thinking again, maybe, maybe I'm on the wrong path. But I think in all those events, I've been blessed to have a supportive family, supportive spouse, supportive mentors and leaders who helped me at the time realize like, hey, these are setbacks and, and you get better by tackling those head on. For the Artemis mission, they're not just PowerPoint slides. They're actually metals being bent, shaped, uh, formed to build the things that we're gonna use. And as a, you know, as a test pilot background, this is uh, you know, <laughs> a dream job to actually be involved in all of this. Now looking back, I would have told myself, hey, just just pause and appreciate what's actually happening around you and the magic of the moment that you're in. Newton talks about, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. Now, I'm definitely not a giant, but if I can throw a little stepping stone out there, that would be my goal. My name is Raja Chari. What am I doing? We're videotaping this? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our newest astronaut, Matthew Dominic. I think if you boil it down to it, uh, I'm a father, a husband, and an explorer. For my whole life, I've always wanted to explore further. I didn't exactly know where I was going to go at any one time, but I always knew I wanted to go further or faster or higher. I remember as a kid going to air shows with, with my dad and just looking at airplanes and I wanted to understand it and so it was just drawn to it. Every air show I went to, I, I wanted to go get in that airplane. I grew up in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. I went to the University of San Diego for electrical engineering and went to Naval Postgraduate School as well, Naval Test Pilot. 
It's certainly uh, a sacrifice for family and friends. Being in the military, you know, we would go on deployments and lose contact with them, and they understood the risk that we were taking. You think about the immense responsibility put on you at times. Uh, you don't want to let the world down, uh, but it's about pushing humanity forward and keeping America safe. Watching rockets launch, right? I mean, watching the shuttle launches as a kid was an enabler for me. It's like, how do, how do I become a part of that? How do I join that team to go do that? Godspeed to the class of 2017. You, know, you find out you're getting this job, and that's huge. But really, that first time that you go put your hands into the gloves is it, just a very interesting moment. It's a pinch me moment. And you realize that this is, this is real. This is going to happen. We're going. My previous job was to keep the world from going backwards. This job is about getting the world to go forwards. Pojo brings a lot of energy to our team, and he is always definitely 100% in in anything he does. NASA astronaut Matthew Dominic. My earliest idea of who I wanted to be growing up was my father. My father was a police officer, and so I wanted to be a police officer. And then I saw a shuttle launch on television, and I thought, I really want to drive one of those. And yes, I said drive, because I didn't know any pilots or engineers even for that matter. I'm a public servant, and I have been for 22 years, since January of 1998. And so I ask myself, have I done all that I can for my country and for my family? I have fantasized about stepping on the moon. It's my dream. My dream is to work on the surface of the moon. And being able to launch humans from American soil is a very big part of that. I was sitting at my desk in the Russell Senate office building, and I got a phone call from a Houston phone number, and by the time I answered, I missed it. <laughs> and so I called back, and after a lot of waiting and being transferred, I was transferred to uh, Janet Cavandi, who was the chair of our board, and she asked me if I wanted to come to Houston and commence training. And I actually pinched myself several times walking back to my office. There is no way that this is a real thing. I'm gonna wake up and be so disappointed. When I woke up the next day, and I actually had an email from Janet saying, it was not a dream. It was, that was actually unreal. <laughs> He's a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy, where he flew F-18s. He came to us from Washington, D.C., where he was serving as the United States Navy Legislative Fellow in the United States Senate. Victor? Being selected for this job, you, you can't help but to think of, I've got so many friends that I know could do this job well. And, and that feeling of, wow, why didn't they get it? And you know, feeling like you're not really good enough cut out for the job. And I felt all of those things, being a father, a husband, all of those things come with doubt. And I think you have to learn to get comfortable with the doubt. They call things moonshots when people accomplish something amazing. No matter how good a story you tell, people are captivated by real world accomplishment. It's our generation's opportunity to have our own literal moonshot and then to continue inspiring future generations to reach for the moon. They not only have the right stuff, they represent the full tapestry of American diversity. Their journey begins now and the nation will be right beside them, reaching for the stars. I actually thought that I was not experienced enough, didn't have the credentials I needed to actually become an astronaut. The reason I'd want to go to space with Woody isn't just because he's brilliant, which he is, but it's because he carries his brilliance in such a way that you don't feel like you're an idiot when you're around him. It's funny all the little decisions in life that get you to where you're going. My earliest memories, I remember building little toys out of wood. Over time, got to building like 21 foot tall uh, rockets, and one of those is still up at my parents' place, stored in their barn. I remember agonizing over what my major should be, and finally I sort of threw up my hands and said, I really like airplanes and things that fly, so I'll do aerospace engineering. 
one of the best decisions of my life was taking summers away from grad school to work search and rescue in Yosemite. One of my favorite parts of the job was getting thrown into situations where I wasn't quite sure what to do. The confidence I gained from that was that I can deal with the unexpected and adapt and overcome. The other great thing about Woody is he applies that brilliance across all phases of his life, whether it's in the outdoors where he basically saved half our class from getting severe hypothermia like it was no big deal. And then uh, on his very first uh, space station sim, nonchalantly directed the, the whole team through an emergency response like he'd done it a hundred times. I've always had a slight tension in me between sort of the engineer, analytical, problem-solving part of me and this sort of operational side of me that wanted to be out experiencing the world with my hands. I feel really lucky to be here now where I have an opportunity to do operational things but also solve really hard technical problems. When we go do hard things and challenge ourselves in that way, we will learn new things that will benefit us. Ladies and gentlemen, our next newest astronaut, Woody Hoberg. <laughs> I'm an engineer, I'm a pilot, I'm a climber, and I'm now an NASA astronaut. Ladies and gentlemen, the newest NASA astronaut, Jonathan Kim. You're a Navy SEAL with a degree from Harvard Medical School. Dr. Jonathan Kim. That's just ridiculous. Exploration is written in our human DNA. When I realized that being an astronaut is really the opportunity to expand our understanding of the cosmos, to make our world a better place, all while inspiring the next generation of children. You, Julian. The same children that didn't have the confidence to dream like I did. That was when I realized that I absolutely wanted to be an astronaut. Like a lot of immigrant families, my parents moved to America with the hope of the American dream that their children can have a better opportunity in this world. I had a hard time growing up as a kid. I lacked a lot of things, but the biggest thing I lacked was confidence. I wake up every day and I think about the opportunities I've had. It's hard for me to believe that I'm that same person. Yeah, well, you just beam, right? You spend so much effort and, and hope, and then you try to give whatever the student needs to, to grow and get where they want to be. And then when you see that they get there, it's, mm. it's just thrilling. It makes me immensely proud to be part of an organization to achieve such a monumental challenge like returning to the moon. And that's what really excites me when I think of Artemis. The lives that we're going to positively impact on this endeavor. It's hard to articulate all of those emotions, but it's, wow. I am an astronaut and I have this amazing opportunity to serve my country and humanity. To me, he is service above self. I would trust my life to him, and I'm very proud to call him my friend. Today's spaceflight will be the very first for NASA's Christina Cook. We have to answer humanity's call to explore. We have to set ourselves as the leadership and proactively seeking out challenges and learning that when we focus on one thing and we focus on it together, we can achieve anything. I am someone who has loved exploration on the frontier since I was little. I used to be inspired by the night sky and throughout my career, it's been this balance between engineering for space science missions and doing science in really remote places all over the world. I loved things that made me feel small, things that made me ponder the size of the universe, my place in it, and everything that was out there to explore. 
And I put that stuff to work, making science gadgets for NASA space science missions and working really hard in that career, but also setting goals in hobbies that I had. I learned to rock climb, I learned to sail, um, finally learning surfing at this point in my life. And so I think working hard on all fronts um, to be a better person and to contribute the most to the world is really what's important to me. I really don't remember a time when I didn't want to be an astronaut. For me, I learned that if I was going to be an astronaut, it was because my passions turned me into someone that could contribute the most as someone contributing to human spaceflight. So I didn't necessarily live my life according to checkboxes of how you can become an astronaut, but I followed those passions and one year looked at who I had become and the skills I had gathered and I asked, could I sit across from a table and present myself as someone who could do this well? And I thought, I'm going to give it a shot. You know, there was a moment where it came to me that this was the most exquisite personal and professional moment of my life. A moment of career culmination where everything I had learned personally, professionally, every skill I had been taught, every hero I had emulated, it was all coming together in this moment. And I realized that I wanted my work to tell every single person on earth that they could have that moment too if they worked hard for it. And I wanted every single person on earth to feel that same feeling. I've had that dream of becoming an astronaut for as long as I can remember. Next, the U.S. astronaut Chell Lindgren, the 217th visitor to the International Space Station. What a privilege to have had that experience, to live and work on the International Space Station. When you go out of the airlock and you start moving around on the outside of the space station, looking through that plastic visor at that scene that occupies your entire field of view, uh, to see the Earth spinning quickly below is breathtaking. It was really watching the Space Shuttle Columbia launch in 1981. And that's really when uh, I had that eureka moment that people actually do this. People go into space and maybe that's something that I could pursue. I was accepted into the Air Force Academy and it was there that I actually discovered a passion for biology and specifically the effects of weightlessness on the human body. But I remember very clearly going into Denver one night and unfortunately seeing a young woman get hit by a car right in front of me while I was on the sidewalk. And I felt like, you know what, I've been studying biology, but I want to know more. I want to know what I would need to do to actually help this person. And so my path shifted a little bit and uh, I ended up going to medical school. I had the great fortune to be hired on as a flight surgeon, a physician that takes care of the astronauts, the crew. And then an astronaut selection was announced and I threw my hat in the ring and had the, the great privilege of being selected into the 2009 astronaut class. We go to the moon because it means further building that bridge of knowledge that is required to get to Mars and an expansion of humanity and the solar system. I'm grateful to be a part of this team. You know, getting to do this job is not an individual accomplishment. It represents effort and work of folks that have been walking alongside me, my family, classmates, colleagues, teachers, mentors, coaches. I am grateful for their investment of time and energy in helping me to achieve this goal. I definitely have heroes. My first heroes would be my parents. They've taught me perseverance and discipline. They gave me that foundation I needed as a young woman to then move forward and achieve my dreams later on in life. I was fortunate enough to get accepted to the United States Naval Academy. It was the summer before my senior year at the Academy that I got a ride in an F-18. That's the first time that I realized I can be a Marine and be a fighter pilot at the same time. This is the best of both worlds, count me in. And so I was uh, selected to go to test pilot school. And it was during that time that I started looking at what are my future options gonna be in the Marine Corps? What do I really wanna do? 
NASA says it's accepting applications for new astronauts. Of the roughly 3,500 applicants NASA is expecting, only about 15 will be selected for training. And I thought to myself, well, that's crazy. There's no way that, that I would ever be accepted to become an astronaut. And I went home and I spoke with my husband about it. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, why would you ever pass up such an incredible opportunity? If you never apply, you're never going to know if you could make it or if you could have made it. That really changed my perspective on life. So I applied to become an astronaut. And I was very fortunate enough to be selected in the class of 2013. I'm thrilled to be joining the NASA team and looking forward to the next two years of training. Thank you. And we've been training ever since, preparing to support current missions on board the International Space Station. And now we're preparing for the Artemis mission. Just as the United States was the first nation to reach the moon in the 20th century, so too will we be the first nation to return astronauts to the moon in the 21st century. Artemis and our mission to the moon is no longer some far-fetched dream or some science fiction idea. This is reality. We are going. What we're gonna learn on the moon goes beyond space exploration. It benefits humans on Earth. It gives enthusiasm to our younger generation to go after their dreams and to help be a part of this evolution of our human race. I think if anything, I probably am a little bit of an impractical dreamer. You know, be really unrealistic about your dreams. And just be really realistic about your path. When I was a little girl growing up in Spokane, Washington, becoming an astronaut, like nobody did that. There was no, there was nobody that I could look to and say that person walked the path that I'm about to go walk. The first step I took out of Spokane was to go to West Point. That was a huge leap out of my comfort zone. As I was flying across the country for the first time ever going to New York City, I remember thinking, like, if, if I had the opportunity to get off this plane and not do this, I probably would have taken it. But you push through that. I remember sitting on the airplane and flying down to NASA for an astronaut interview, and I had the exact same feeling as when I was flying to West Point as an 18-year-old kid. And it was like, maybe this is where I've reached too far. Maybe this is where I've pushed too far. This is where it all ends. What little girls from Spokane, Washington, grew up to be an astronaut? I'm just not even going to try. And so when I say I'm an impractical dreamer, I mean, I never listen to that part of me that says, hey, you're probably not going to succeed at this. I always listen to the part that said, well, somebody's going to. Maybe it's going to be you. We have liftoff of Anne McLean blasting through the Kazakh sky to the International Space Station. You know, I've always been so focused on my goals, and I've always just sprinted toward those goals. And when I look back at all the achievements, the achievements aren't actually what I remember. It's the people that I did them with. The person that wins the rugby match is the one that, despite all of those hits, despite all of the contact, actually thinks 10 steps ahead, thinks five steps ahead as a team, and it's a strategy game. Now, working here as an astronaut, one of the toughest things that we do are spacewalks. You have got to stay so mentally tuned in, you have to know that you can push your body further than you think you can. And I'm holding on to a handrail on the International Space Station, and I'm looking out at the vastest space, and I looked back and I felt like this was my planet. I was attached to it through gravity. And I felt a closeness to the Earth. And I also realized how much more we have to explore. We haven't even started yet. Our destiny is always to go and see what's further and what's next. I first started saying I wanted to be an astronaut when I was five years old. We were asked to draw a picture of what we wanted to be when we grew up, and I distinctly remember drawing an astronaut in a spacesuit standing on the surface of the moon next to the American flag. People always associated space with me. They called me space girl. They knew that it was this ultimate passion that I had and this goal. In this historic moment, first time that two women have done a spacewalk together, 
I wrote this in my high school yearbook. It, and under future plans, I said to go for a spacewalk. Never forget that moment coming out the hatch and looking down and seeing just my boots and the earth below. And it was such a spectacular and beautiful sight. I probably didn't have the most traditional path of becoming an astronaut. It was biology and understanding more about animals that really drove me. And so that's what I pursued. I'm always telling people everybody should be scuba divers. There's this whole world underwater that most people don't get to experience. And for me, being in space shares a lot of the similarities of that underwater world. You're traveling around and moving in a different realm. You have to trust in your hardware, trust in your equipment, and trust in all the people that have helped you get where you are. In my experience as a scientist diving underwater or working as an astronaut in space, you're challenged both mentally and physically at the same time. And I think those are the times when I've really felt the most content in my life. The thing is, it just keeps getting better and better. From the moment I arrived on the space station, I've had a huge smile on my face. Following your heart and following the things that you're passionate about, you can still achieve your dreams and your goals, and that's exactly what happened for me. I think I've always looked up at the moon and thought about what it would be like to be there. We're going to the moon to explore, and we're going to the moon for scientific discovery. I don't look at this as my own accomplishment or something just for me. This is our mission. This is everybody's mission. Our entire planet's really. I'm NASA astronaut Jessica Meir. I still wake up every morning and it feels like a pinch me moment to think that I'm actually an astronaut right now. I am Jasmine Mugbelli. I think as a kid, I believed I could do anything. So to me, I was gonna be in the NBA, I was gonna be an astronaut, and I was gonna be an Olympic skier. So to me, it didn't phase me. I've been very lucky to be surrounded by people that have always supported me. My husband, my parents, they 100% have supported me. Jasmine Mokelly. As I started to overcome more challenges through my life, I realized, hey, I could possibly really do this. I think it's 100% natural to have doubt. What's important is how you respond to that doubt and just let that be your driver to work harder and figure out a different way to do things. I think there are a lot of reasons for going to the moon. Our curiosity, who in the world doesn't stare up at the moon and just wonder, while we've been there before, we've only explored a limited region of it. And so getting to learn more about the moon, I think not only can teach us more about Earth and our own planet, but also can set us up for going further and going to Mars. When you talk about the way we want to go to the moon for Artemis, one, going to the lunar south pole, just landing on that south pole with the lighting conditions. There are permanent shadowed regions, so you know, we can't use solar energy necessarily. What resources are on the moon that we can use? How much of them are there? How can we use a base from the moon to go further? Anything that might jeopardize the mission, whether I'm on it or not, those are the things that kind of keep me up uh, when, when I lay down at night, and those are the things that I think about. It's a deep question. Who am I? Well, I'm a wife now. I am a, a daughter, my parents' favorite uh, child, probably. I'm a Marine, and I'm an astronaut. People ask you when you're a kid, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a, an astronaut, a biologist, and a geologist. So, you know, when you're five, this seems totally reasonable. Studying microbiology on stations is very similar to the Earth, except for you're floating. You may be doing the same experiment, but you're conducting it on the ceiling. 
because that's a convenient place to work. We're studying things like sequencing DNA, what happens to the human body in space, and even viruses are an issue in space. I get really excited about things and something about viruses, about biology. I'm totally fascinated by it and I want to get up and go work on this every day. became the first person to sequence DNA in space. The addition of NASA astronaut Kate Rubens. These three are about to begin the first planned two-orbit flight to the International Space Station with humans on board. Space is both a place that is like this far off, almost fantastical thing that you think about and people dream about. But then on the other hand, to me, it's, it's a home. I've been there, I've lived there for six months. Now I have friends there. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to going back there like you would look forward to visiting an old apartment. The moon is an incredible destination. We have been there, but we were there for such a brief period of time. Apollo, it united the world. And so to think, you know, when we're having dark times, to think of the fact that we might have people on the planet able to look up and know that there's humans on the moon and that we've done this as a joint international collaboration. I can't even describe what kinds of the benefits that might be, both for our partnerships in the world and just for joy and inspiration in people's everyday lives. Less than 10 minutes away from today's launch, this is Kate Rubin celebrating her birthday with a launch to the International Space Station. I think if I was going to talk to my younger self, I would say, don't be so stressed out about what you're doing at the moment, because it's such an honor to be a scientist and to be an astronaut. Just enjoy what you're doing every day. You know, I'm a product of a lot of sacrifices and great teams. I'm a son of a uh, teenage single mom. You know, it was never an option to feel sorry for ourselves or to use that as a crutch. Uh, it was just, hey, you can do better. You can uh, get ahead by working hard, studying hard. Uh, and so that kind of set a really good foundation of hard work equals results. Good morning, Frank Rubio from Miami, Florida. Graduated from West Point, 98, go Army, Black Hawk pilot, and then a uh, family medicine physician. The Army has essentially shaped me. I mean, uh, it's given me all these amazing opportunities. The reality is I've just always been surrounded by people that are next level. Being around those type of people my, my entire career, I think has pushed me to do better and also kept me humble. When Vice President Pence was announcing our class, he made an analogy to a turtle on a fence post, uh, basically meaning that, hey, you didn't get there on your own. He was talking, of course, about our families, our loved ones, our, our co-workers, our teams, essentially, that allowed us to succeed and get to that point in our lives. Frank is truly a, uh, a wonderful person. He is a great American and even better human being, and he's going to make an awesome astronaut. Uh, and I really look forward and hope I get the chance to go to space with him one day. What the moon will allow us to do is to explore further than we ever have before. Anytime we've explored in the history of mankind, uh, there's great benefits from a technological uh, point of view. Uh, but I think deeper than that, there's a sense of pride and unity that comes with accomplishing incredibly hard things. Uh, and right now, probably more than ever as a nation and as a world, uh, we need that. Watching how America comes together in those moments, in those bigger than life moments, uh, is something that's really incredible to behold. Right now, an American astronaut, a Japanese astronaut, and a Russian cosmonaut are strapped inside of a Soyuz spacecraft. There's always the, uh, why don't you climb the mountain, because it's there. We all travel down the street, we look out the window, we're in the backyard, there are moons out there. You can't miss it. It's beautiful. It's there every day. Why would we not want to go there? We need to go there. One minute, ten seconds away from liftoff. It was in uh, junior high. 
the teacher asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And everyone was saying, I want to be a plumber, I want to be an architect, I want to be an accountant. And I said, I want to be an astronaut. And literally everyone in the class laughed. But then the teacher looked at me and said, right on. And lift off. Scott Tingle, Anton Shkaparov, and Norshi Kinai on their way to the International Space Station. Look, this is uh, evolution. We didn't always have the technology and the capability that we have today. We didn't always have automobiles. We weren't always able to just jump in a vehicle and travel for 16 hours and get to the other side of the country. So this is the next step in evolution, to be able to take systems and hone our processes and get our operations down so that we can set up camp on a place that's different from Earth so that we can conduct science that'll better humankind. This was just a dream when I, when I first met my wife. You know, was it going to happen? Was it not going to happen? Who knows? But we're here and we're doing it. And every step we take is both a challenge and a reward. And to be able to live that life and, and look back at the track that we used to get here is, uh, is just amazing. Life is pretty busy when you have lofty goals and you're constantly focused, you're constantly working to get positive results. But that moment for me was coming out of the Soyuz on my first space flight and standing on the ground for the first time in six months and realizing that I did it. A dream feels like a big, far away goal that's going to be difficult to achieve and something that you might achieve much later in life. But in reality, what a dream is, or a dream realized is, is just putting one foot in front of the other on a daily basis. And if you put enough of those footprints together, eventually they become a path towards your dreams. My name is Jessica Watkins, and my fellow astronauts would describe me as a rock nerd, endearingly, I, as what I tell myself at least. One of the things that I enjoy the most about geology intellectually is you kind of function as a detective. You're looking at different puzzle pieces, you know, all kind of in different places, and you're, you're trying to bring those puzzle pieces together to get a full story, a full history of what has happened in a particular place. For me, as somebody who was really interested in the planets, geology provided a means for me to study the surface of another planet, and particularly look at Mars, which was my passion, was just super exciting to me. In college, uh, I was lucky enough to get the opportunity to learn to play rugby. It was one of the best opportunities in my life, getting to play with the rugby team at Stanford and play in national championships and even win one. I think one of the biggest lessons that I take away from my rugby career is the importance of teamwork. Rugby in particular has positions that are all suited to different types of body types, different strengths um, that people bring to the table. And I think that is not unlike our team here at NASA, where everybody comes and brings their different strengths, their different expertise to form a powerful and winning team. This endeavor to go to the moon is going to be hard it is not something that we can do individually. It's not something that we can do on our own. And I think especially in these times, it's really important for us to recognize how much we need each other and the importance of coming together for one goal. And I think that going back to the moon really embodies that. This is Mission Control Houston. We are now processing a telemetry from the Orion spacecraft. Mission Specialist number three, Stephanie Wilson. Making her first flight into space. She'll sit in that seat right between and behind the pilot commander. ATD, MS3, contact. MS3, this is NTD. I've got you loud and clear. Good morning, Stephanie. Every space flight is special. The first space flight is very memorable for everyone. On the day of launch, everyone's very excited. 
and it's very surreal when the uh, solid rocket boosters and the main engines ignite. It's very apparent that we're going somewhere, and it's the best eight and a half minute ride ever. The view from space is spectacular. It can be very peaceful, very serene. The colors are so vivid. The vibrant orange of the Sahara Desert, the blue-green color of the oceans. It's a wonderful sight to behold. And what is readily transparent is that while there may or may not be strife on Earth, it appears to us to be one unified planet. And having that perspective of one Earth and one humanity is one that we definitely appreciate having from space. I had a great curiosity for what's unknown, and I like to solve problems. So trying to understand and have a better sense of the universe and what that means to humanity, who we are, what our history is, and how we leverage that knowledge to bring benefits to humanity was something that struck me and I hope to work with in the future. I have certainly benefited by having some great mentors in the office across NASA. One thing that veterans of space flights do is they share their expertise and their experience during the mission. Christina on the UIA, check oxygen EM1 and 2. Oxygen EM1 and 2 are open. And I do my best to pass along the experience and the knowledge that I have gained to others in the office and with the next generation so that we can have a better future for all of humanity.